Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Provost Ralph Hexter, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first event in the 2015-16 season of the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. When a number of us established this forum four years ago, we believed it would help fill a critical need in the larger uh, institutional-wide conversation on what public universities in the 21st century should be. We hope that series would promote a uniquely informed and rational dialogue on the topic, and that it would catch on with our campus community and the public. As we embark on year four, I'm very gratified to report continuing success on both of these fronts. I'm even more pleased to announce that in the coming months, we'll be working to take the series to the next level, further growing its benefits to the campus and our region by increasing broad awareness of its events, easy accessibility to its archived videos, and possibilities for community participation. We also have some extraordinary presentations planned for this year, beginning with the one that brings us together today. So I look forward to seeing you at many subsequent events. Today's program follows our usual format with our speaker presentations followed by an audience Q&A period. I know that will be lively. As soon as the Q&A is over, we will begin our reception on the inside patio, and I hope everyone will be able to stay for food, refreshments, and of course, continued dialogue. I want to thank five campus entities that have joined the Office of the Provost to co-sponsor this event. UC Davis Medical Center, the Betty Ivy Moore School of Nursing, the College of Biological Sciences, the Center for Regional Change, and the Community and Regional Development Program. So, for today's program, we are very fortunate to have as our speakers Julie Freischlock, Vice Chancellor for Human Health Sciences at UC Davis and Dean of the UC Davis School of Medicine, and Glenn Richard Olds, Founding Dean of the UC Riverside School of Medicine and current President of St. George's University in Granada. During the past three years, a great many of our speakers have addressed what is widely known as the crisis in public higher education. The word crisis serves as an umbrella term for multiple urgent challenges in such areas as educational accessibility and affordability, financial solvency for institutions, and core ideas about what public universities should do and be. As our speakers today will make clear, today medical centers and medical schools at public universities also face these and other formidable challenges. To take but one example, the cost of medical education has long been significantly subsidized by public funding and fees for services, but the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and reductions of money to universities in general is definitely putting pressure on this source of funding, something that Dean Freshlock and I are both very concerned with. <coughs> UC Davis is one of five UC campuses with a nationally recognized medical center that provides broad access to top-ranked specialized care, supports clinical teaching programs, and develops new therapies. The UC Riverside School of Medicine, of which President Olds was founding dean, was established to address a severe crisis in medical care in that region. And so the presentations of both of our speakers will be especially relevant to the UC community and Californians, for they will address challenges that directly impact UC's mission to provide, uh, excuse me, to improve quality of life for all the people in our state. The joint title of their presentations is Universities, Hospitals, and the Social Mission. As Vice Chancellor for Human Health Sciences at UC Davis and Dean of UC School of Medicine, Julie Freischlag oversees UC Davis Health System's academic, research, and clinical programs, including the School of Medicine, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, the Thousand Members Physician Practice Group, and UC Davis Medical Center. Dean Freischlag is one of the most prominent leaders among the nation's academic health centers. For more than 15 years, she has led education and training programs at top medical schools in her role as professor and chair of surgery and vascular surgery departments. Before joining UC Davis's health system, she served as professor, chair of the surgery department and surgeon-in-chief at John Hopkins Medical Institutions. She led initiatives to expand research, add specialty clinical services, improve patient-centered care, 
and patient safety, redesign the surgical training program, and enhance academic career paths for faculty. Dean Fleischler received a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Illinois and a medical degree from Rush University Medical College in Chicago. She completed her surgical residency and vascular fellowship at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Glenn Richard Olds is the new president and chief executive officer of St. George's University in Granada. Prior to this, he was most recently the vice chancellor for health affairs and founding dean of the School of Medicine for the University of California, Riverside. In 2010, Dr. Olds joined UC Riverside to lead the creation of a new school of medicine, which was intended to address the severe doctor shortage in inland Southern California. He's a tropical disease specialist with extensive experience working in Asia and Africa. He has served on the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Schistosomiosis. He graduated from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and trained in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He was an infectious disease fellow and one of the nation's first geographic medicine fellows at university hospitals in Cleveland, where he also served as medical chief resident and faculty member. He served as full professor of medicine, pediatrics, molecular and molecular and cell and developmental biology at Brown University, and professor and chairman of medicine at the Metro Health Campus of Case Western Reserve University. Please join me in welcoming Dean Freistock and then President Olds. Now, yes, okay, great. Um, so we're really glad to be here. Um, I really appreciate uh, uh, the provost inviting us to talk a bit about how we look at uh, hospitals and universities, because one of the reasons I came here was actually to work with a university that uh, was involved with a hospital, and also to work in the whole consortium of UCs, uh, which we're leaning towards trying to create a whole UC health. Um, and the other lesson from all of this is really to learn um, about people you meet along the way. I met uh, President Olds in Milwaukee years and years ago, so we actually were good friends then. So you never know who might uh, roll around again uh, afterwards. So uh, it's great. I invited him to join me, which uh, the provost was really uh, lovely to include, because he actually had to champion a different model in order to make his life work. And, and we enjoyed each other while I was here till he got his new position. So UC Davis School of Medicine, I want to just tell you a little history about that, because uh, it actually is a nice story uh, in the sense that the UC Davis School of Medicine and Medical Cent uh, Center really is all about persistence. That's sort of our area, isn't it? Uh, how to get there, we're one of the youngest besides Riverside Medical School, so he was the baby, I was the teenager in our groups to do it, and I trained at UCLA, and I worked at UCSD, and I actually was a, a medical student for a month at UCSS, so everyone's got their flavor, and I have lots of friends that are at Riverside. Thank you very much. Um, so what's great about the UC systems is they all have different flavors, and so part of my job in my first year and a half here was to really learn UC Davis and, and learn who we are and why we're here and what makes us unique. So some of you may remember, because you were here, is that UC Davis School of Medicine was established in 1966. Um, the long-range plan, which actually I never knew until we started talking about hospitals, was to put the hospital in Davis. So when you think back, you know, 60 years ago, the plan was that the hospital was going to be in Davis at that time. Uh, there was an affiliation at the time with the county hospital in Sacramento because that was the hospital around, but that was only supposed to be temporary, and they eventually we were going to have a state-of-the-art hospital here. So our founding dean was uh, C. John Tupper, which uh, uh, many things are named after him. Our main research building out here was named after him. And of course, at the time, the chancellor was uh, Emil Marat, who actually, they're the ones that had the vision to start this to make a difference. So what happened after that? Why didn't that happen? Um, money. Almost everything is money. So lack thereof back in the 70s. I was in high school, so it wasn't my fault. Okay, I was in Hinsdale. 
But um, the school had to refocus because a, a bond issue, a, a, a bond deal failed in Davis. They voted no uh, to build a new hospital. So we need to remind people that we had a chance, okay, a long time ago. And at the time, costs were skyrocketing. So it's probably the right thing that happened, mainly because of the small population in Davis at the time. And if you look at where our population has grown, it really has been in Sacramento in the region. But because of that, because of the combined skyrocketing time of money and the relationship between the university and county actually got a little dicey at that time because we were trying to teach medical students on this campus, trying to get them trained. Um, the university finally purchased the county hospital for a dollar. And it's true, it was for one dollar. So in 1972, after much noise, um, the university purchased it and as with all um, good deeds, they never go unpunished. Why did they sell it to, to a dollar at the time? They actually were having a lot of issues with making ends meet, but the medical school needed a hospital, so here we were, and the university took the title back in 1973. So at the time, the medical students actually were mainly on this campus, as many of you will remember. They did their first two years here. They would go down to the county hospital for the second two years. But a new education building was built uh, in 2006. At that time, the funding primarily for that building came from the hospital. So that's probably going to be a song I'm going to sing quite a bit today, is the hospital, when you are part of a university and you're a teaching hospital, hospital profits frequently help build buildings, support programs, recruit chairs, and make the whole academic dream come true. That's why you really want a, a university hospital um, that is actually making money, being profitable, so that you can um, have uh, many of your programs work. I have worked at hospitals, both uh, President Olds and I have at Milwaukee, where we didn't own our hospital. So Freighter Hospital was a private hospital. We had a university right next to them. And I cannot tell you all the many arguments we would have, because you would go over and, and, and have to make a case for every single program you wanted to do, so the hospital would give you money. Sometimes you would set up MOUs, sometimes you'd do this, but frankly, it was two different budgets. It was just like what he's going to talk a little bit now, that you didn't really own it. At Hopkins, where I worked, and at UCLA and all the other UCs, the hospitals are owned by the university, and therefore it's more of a, a combined effort. But the hospital does fuel uh, the School of Medicine's budget for their academic activities. So they actually built that building. There was some money... A little bit of money from the state. Uh, the state did build our telemedicine uh, <coughs> building, but most of that building was built by the hospital to house our medical students. So all four of the stu uh, your students then moved there in 2006, so that's how I see it now when I arrived two years ago, where the first year students and second year students have all their lectures. Today we have two town halls on diversity and inclusion there, so the students, I run into them all the time. They spend time in the hospital as well as many other hospitals now in the area getting their training. They actually spend time at Kaiser and Sutter and down at Fresno and many things, but the main teaching hospital is the same county hospital. And I'll tell you, it hasn't changed much since we bought it for a buck. Uh, so we're actually having to do a lot of uh, renovations to our hospital because of seismic issues. So we just passed, we just had the regions pass a, uh, a referendum for us to build a new tower that's worth $70 million because we have to tear down part of the old hospital. We have new operating rooms that actually were built about uh, eight years ago because we had to tear down part of the hospital because of seismic. And we do need a new tower in the hospital, which we actually have on board for the next eight years to have single rooms and make it a, an amazing hospital because it's a hospital from the 60s. Um, we actually love all the students around there, but one of the uh, detriments is that you don't see them as much out here. And we're really trying to figure out ways where the students can spend some of their research time or extra time in Tupper Hall and genomics and engineering. And we have many of our professors and, uh, uh, that go back and forth that spend time here doing research um, and then do spend more time uh, also teaching students down there. So the Causeway is one of our friends. Uh, we are dreaming of a light rail that may actually take us back and forth because today I left at 2.15 and I was hoping I wouldn't meet a lot of our friends going one way or the other. And sometimes, as you know, it can be very dicey going back and forth on the Causeway. And I think has prevented some of our younger faculty getting involved with uh, research now that they have to do more clinical work because we're actually looking at still trying to maintain a profit in the hospital with changing times and trying to get back and forth. 
However, as a young faculty member, when I was at UCLA, I actually worked at the VA, which is on one side of Wilshire. And my research lab uh, was on the other side of Wilshire in the psych area. There's a whole psych count. So no one knew I was over there. So I would get in my car, drive underneath the bridge, and spend two days a week doing my research over on the Sawtell area, the psych area, where there were a couple of research laboratories. And it was great, because when I got there, no one knew where I was. I could do my research all day. I signed out my patients to others. So we're really trying to create that environment now that young faculty would come out here a couple of days a week and do their research, and they can't find you. you know, so you can't go see that patient. You cover that with someone else. And we're hoping to really make that better. We talked to Paul Fitzgerald and Fernando Santana, who's our new head of physiology. I think we will be able to create a, a better, robust interconnection between some young faculty, medical students, uh, as well as uh, our postdocs. We also have a lot of graduate students now down at the Sacramento campus. We're not quite sure how many, but there's hundreds of them that are spending time at the hospital, school of nursing. So there actually is a, a big exchange going between both our, our so what is UC Davis Health System? So this is the main hospital that we purchased. It looks pretty nice, but if you have been a patient or you've been in there, no single rooms. Uh, some of them are very small. Um, the operating rooms are actually off to, the, uh, to your right, and they're beautiful. They're big, state-of-the-art, gorgeous operating rooms. I'm a surgeon, as many of you know. They couldn't be any better than that. But the part of the hospital that goes to the left is what needs to come down, because it's actually very old classic, lovely, but seismic incompatible with uh, California. So I oversee the School of Medicine, which are the medical students, 110 per year. Uh, the Medical Center, which is uh, 579 licensed beds. Our new Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, which is a new nursing school, as you know, that was uh, begun with a, a large uh, philanthropic gift from uh, Betty Irene Moore. We're actually um, building a building, and I, I'm glad to say the provost has been extremely generous helping us build that building, because in these times, the hospital can't afford to build complete buildings, so all of us are in together, the medical center, the school of medicine, as well as uh, the provost is helping build the new school uh, for nursing, and it just broke ground, so we're having a groundbreaking officially on November 10th. Beautiful building that's going to be for everyone. It's going to be multidisciplinary with great simulations for home visits, a great big auditorium, because we don't have a big auditorium. We still have our graduation at Mangabi, because I don't have an auditorium over 120 seats. At, uh, they sort of forgot that when we moved. Um, so now with this, we're going to have a big auditorium where we can have uh, large events. And then our medical group, which is our thousand physicians. So we have a group of physicians that large primary care network that's aimed really all the way up to Tahoe. Uh, and we also are now trying to affiliate with about 15 different hospitals, those north, south, and also west. So those that live in Davis, since we never built that hospital, that we actually could affiliate perhaps with some hospitals in Fairfield or even as close to San Francisco as we can get. So you would have a hospital that you could go to if you were in the UC Davis Medical Group. As you know, there is a clinic here out of Davis, which has uh, got specialty care there, and we're having a new, another open house on uh, October 30th for that. A great uh, clinic for people to go to, and also we, we're starting extended hours and some urgent care, because we know that there's needs out here at Davis, and knowing how long the drive is, going all the way to see our hospital is probably not something everyone wants to do. Also, our hospital is the only level one trauma center in the northern part of California. So if you go into our emergency room at night, it's not just bruises and bumps and stitches. There are people that have been in car accidents. You've heard the story about the fellow that fell into the lake over 4th of July and tore his aorta in half. Those people are coming in all the time. 30% of our business is major trauma. So our emergency room would probably be a little bit underwhelmed if you had a broken finger. So we need to get you a place out here in many places where you can have smaller things looked at as well. We are uh, one of the biggest employers. Uh, we uh, generate 3.4 billion in annual outcome. We have more than 20,000 people that work there. And we are the region's only academic medical health center. And you'll hear with my new campaign, we are the best academic medical health care center in Northern California uh, because of all the things we do besides trauma care as well as research. So in the country, there's many ways to do this. Uh, where I came from in Hopkins, it was a private uh, institution, but Johns Hopkins owned the hospital. So it was a 
similar symbiotic relationship. There are public hospitals. We are a safety net hospital. We take care of everyone here. So did Hopkins. Uh, however, UCLA does not take care of everyone because they have a county system there. So UCLA and UCSF take care of patients who can pay because they have a county hospital right in their city that would take care of patients who cannot pay. So it's sort of a different system. Where UC Irvine and UC San Diego and us are the safety net hospitals in our region. And, and he'll talk a bit about his affiliation with the county hospitals in Riverside. There can be three standing academic health care centers that have nothing to do with the university. That's UCSF. You know, there is no university there. It's mainly a medical center uh, with all the nursing schools and pharmacy schools, but they do not have uh, an undergraduate campus. And then there are university-based like ours. And we really love the fact that we all are fully integrated. We are academic, clinical, and research functions. One person, one board of directors to do that. And however, what I just described to you from Milwaukee was where you had two systems operating side by side, which has some benefits when one's losing money and one's not. You can actually exchange or point at each other who's in trouble. Uh, but at the time, I find that actually is much more difficult to manage. So we think that the educational benefit of university-based hospitals is amazing, and that's where I've spent most of my career. You can give all sorts of education. As the young people change their majors, now that we know they all are into population health and global health, and it's no longer zoology and microbiology, they're incredible that the university can really help you attract these wonderful students that come there. Uh, you get access to biostatistics and ethics and engineering. And, and one of the candidates that's being looked at at biomedical engineering actually was a partner and did research with a vascular surgeon who's one of my best friends. I mean, those are the things that are the benefits. It's the best place to have teach basic sciences. There's no question that Carl Fitzgerald teaches cell biology and anatomy much better than I would because of that. And we get these undergraduate students that can come to our medical schools, do our PhDs, go to nursing school. And that's really the goal in our hills here, all the students. And then teaching is very important for innovation. And we have greater access of the students um, to faculty and researchers when you have a university. And not everyone that walks into the university wants to be a physician ends up being a physician. So what's nice is that they'll see alternatives depending on how they do uh, in their uh, classwork and also where their passion lies. So academic medical centers are really distinguished from non-teaching hospitals, mainly because of their clinical research programs. Uh, we uh, discover drugs, medical devices, and treatments are developed and tested. You can be part of clinical trials. Some private hospitals or non-teaching hospitals will have access. We do affiliate with some. But when you come into our hospital, you'll see an army. Um, when I operate tomorrow, I'll have three of the undergrads from UC Davis watching. I have a a vascular surgeon, Angela, who's trailing me this week from Stony Brook on a leadership conference, she'll be there. I'll be teaching a fellow, a young faculty member, and the anesthesiologist will have a, a nurse anesthetist, a teacher, a student. So you will never feel lonely at an academic health care center because there's lots of teaching going on. It does allow us to do a lot of interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. It really has us do lots of research. There's synergies here, especially between the vet school, the nursing school, and the ag school. And, in the engineering school. Today I sat with Simon Cherry talking about his brand new big PET scanner that they just got the $15 million grant along with a PhD from our Department of Radiology. Those things happen because of our connection. And also I think our philanthropy and our corporate connections are bigger too. Uh, we actually <coughs> had a, a meeting today um, with the uh, university philanthropy group to talk about how we're working in synergy to raise money, not only for this campus, but our campus too, depending on the donor. And we are able to reduce costs by looking at new innovations. Now, teaching hospitals do uh, take care of complex problems. I told you, you know, if you walked into our emergency room with a little bit of pneumonia, cough, or a sprained finger, you know, you would wait a long time to chat with us. We're trying to come up with ways that maybe sitting in your primary care uh, area, we can use telehealth, and so they'll look at your finger and tell you what to do, because our emergency room is very busy. Uh, and we have tons of specialties, so if you need some small uh, piece of what is wrong with you treated by a specialist that maybe be only one or two in the state, we have those, and we enjoy that, and we teach that as well. 
Uh, we also have a lot of connections to our community health programs looking at that connection. So all of that, uh, we get involved with the community with crisis and also uh, prevention programs. And teaching hospitals really are more likely to reach out to the community. We see that in Sacramento, uh, a little bit in Davis, it could be a little bit more improved. And we do do a lot of uh, well uh, programming, well-being programs. We have seven student-run clinics. Um, we actually take care of, as I mentioned, uh, patients who cannot pay. And U.S. teaching hospitals really provide over a third of all hospital charity care. And it's real, where all 25% of all Medicaid hospitalization, our hospital is 36% Medi-Cal admissions. And with the Accountable Care Act, we have less people that are non-pay, and they do have Medi-Cal, but Medi-Cal is what we call covered uncovered. It has uh, funded both by the state as well as the federal government, and our state has not um, placed enough money, we feel, into the Medi-Cal patient, mainly because of uh, some financial constraints we're working on that. So that when they come into our hospital, we actually lose money on every Medi-Cal patient we admit. And we'll still take care of them. But part of it is that we have to then have 60-some percent of people that pay full freight so we can take care of everybody. And that's not dissimilar from any hospital who takes care of our Medi-Cal patients. And the communities really uh, benefit from our volunteer services for the disenfranchised. And we have a lot of programs that would take care of people in the county uh, as well as in the city. Now, because of this, we're expensive, okay? Because we're doing all this teaching training, we're doing all this research, our day per hospital, our cost of doing business is higher. Um, we train medical students, nurses, and other uh, health care providers, and the new Accountable Care Act doesn't really like us much because we are expensive. They would really like us to have many patients with simple diagnoses to stay in more cost-effective hospitals. And that's one of the reasons we're partnering with many hospitals throughout Northern California. So if you have a simple diagnosis, say just a simple heart attack or pneumonia, you can stay in your hospital by your home, which is best for you and your family, in a less expensive hospital, and only come to us if you did fall into a lake and tear your aorta, or if you got hit by a car, or if you have a diagnosis that no one feels comfortable treating. And that's really what many systems are doing now, is getting a whole system of care so that you have the patient in the right place, the right bed at the right time. And some of these uh, cases we take care of, too, are small volumes, so you need to centralize. If you have an unusual diagnosis, you should be at an academic health care center, because there may only be 10 a year. You certainly want to be at the place they may have seen eight. You don't want to be at a place that they go, how interesting. I mean, that's really a bad comment uh, when they do that. Uh, so we really are trying to take care of everyone. So we actually have a dual purpose. We have many people we take care of because we are the safety net hospital. There are many cities that perhaps do a little bit better sharing of the Medi-Cal patient across the city. San Diego is one of those where many of the private hospitals take many more Medi-Cal patients than the Sacramento hospitals do. Um, but we have to keep this up because GME, training the doctors and nurses of tomorrow, really important, is expensive. Um, and residents are paid um, by hospitals. So we get um, money from the uh, federal government to pay them, but any extra ones that we want have to come from hospital money and, and that margin. And the other thing that doesn't make sense but is there is that if you get an NIH grant and you get a certain amount of money to do that, we actually find that for every dollar they give you, it costs a dollar and a quarter. Uh, and therefore, research costs money, and it's just the nature thing always has. But we won't, don't want to give it up because it's really important. So one of the things that keeps me up at night is the present model where the hospital's profits uh, end up giving money to the medical school. And I'll tell you, that number is over $20 million every year that our hospital gives to the School of Medicine to help support research um, for people on this campus and other campuses, medical students, residents, and it's worked really well for many years. Our worry is what happens if our hospital it goes in the red and we don't have a margin and there isn't that money there. And that's what the whole country's worrying about. At the same time, they're thinking of maybe cutting federal funding for training of residents and asking the medical centers to pay for those too. So if both of those were to happen, you know, everyone's out of business. So we are being very uh, thoughtful about how to best spend our money, how to come up with other sources to help us. And I'll, I'll tell you one that we just did last week. So we 
actually have some residents and faculty that work at Travis Air Force Base, which is just down the road. And I actually practiced there too. I've operated on two soldiers who needed an operation. And they set up sites for people to be uh, ready for war. So they need to have their surgeons and physicians ready every day to be deployed. You could argue whether we need to do that, but they feel they need to do that. And unfortunately, the last 10 years, it seems like we need to do that. So they need sites that are ready all the time to keep their physicians up to speed, because most of these military hospitals are not very busy. And they also don't do urgent, urgent things. Travis Air Force Base is basically a small elective hospital. So many of their surgeons spend time at our house, hospital. They pay their salaries. And what's nice is they, we have trauma surgeons and heart surgeons that come work with us. They get to keep up ready to be deployed. Uh, we train their residents in Bastyr. We have half of them. So the general came to make us even a bigger site where we may actually have 50 to 60 residents, maybe 50 or 60 faculty, that they would pay for us to be in our hospital to work to take care of all of us. At the same time, it would suffice them to be uh, Army ready. And if they don't do that, they have to go away every year for six weeks to get trained. So this actually would do them uh, service. So the general came, and I'm hoping we'll get this. So this will be a, a nice influx of money to pay residents and faculty in orthopedics, neurosurgery, and emergency surgery, and vascular, and cardiac, which we do anyway, to help cover that cost in case something does go awry with our funding mechanism. So we're looking at many different ways to do this. This is an equal um, uh, opportunity for both. But it is something that the old model, which we're hearing so much these days, doesn't work as well as we want. And we need to come up with different ways to, to look at uh, covering costs. I'll be proud to say that last year we did have a margin of 4.5%. Most hospitals across the country uh, are hovering around 1% to 2%. And that really is because we're trying to contain costs and do better, and actually the accountable care helped us. Many of our patients who couldn't pay at all had Medi-Cal, so that actually was a little better. So we're getting creative, we're persistent in what we want to do. These are all the hospitals that we participate with telehealth. We're doing a lot of <coughs> telehealth visits in emergency rooms. There are very few neurologists in Northern California, so we actually are delivering stroke care to multiple hospitals in Northern California. We're teaching people how to do distant education for psychiatry and pain management in Northern California. We're actually getting paid for these telehealth visits now, too, so I can actually have a nurse or a doctor in an emergency room in our office in um, Yuba City. We can have a conversation. They can examine the patient in front of me. We can come up with a treatment plan. And if that patient needs to come see me, they will. If not, they can be managed there. Great for the patient. Great for expenses for all around. And also keeps patients in the right place at the right time. We are talking to Adventist Health, which has a, about eight hospital system, a cancer care network. We're actually hosting the medical records uh, for Marshall Hospital as well as Lodi and probably Enlo soon. And those patients, those hospitals will then be part of our network and double the number of beds we have. So we're really trying to be creative to take care of Northern California, cut our costs, keep training and doing research because you never want them 10 years from now to say, what was she thinking? We didn't discover anything. They were just trying to cover costs and make it through. We really want them to continue to do innovation and do research and really turn out great physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers of the future, despite it being a little bit more difficult. I do think we'll never be able to buy a hospital for a dollar again. Um, the price of the new tower that we're putting in is, is probably going to be hundreds of millions of dollars. The new hospital at Hopkins that I helped build was a billion dollars. Uh, so hospitals are not a dollar anymore, um, but we will be able to uh, put a new tower there and also affiliate with more hospitals so that everyone throughout Northern California has an ability to touch a UC Davis provider. UC Davis providers are amazing, and they really gave great care. Uh, and having that ability to touch a UC Davis provider for your care, especially if it's unusual, I think is what I would like all of Northern California to have. So Darwin's one of my favorite. It's not the strongest that survive, but the most intelligent, uh, or the most intelligent, the ones that can say, okay, the world's different. What are we going to change to do? And, and not sit there and say, I really wish it was 20 years ago. Because the one thing I'm for sure of, it will never be 20 years ago, ever. It's always going to be the future. And so we need to respond to that change to go forward. Thanks so much. <laughs> now President Owens will talk about his adventure down at Riverside. I think I've got to do my own. Okay. Um, <laughs> or I can help you.
Well, you were so good with mine. Uh, oh, are you going to do this for me? Okay, good. Okay. 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 Well, good afternoon. I guess I have to adjust this up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You've always been taller than me. I don't know about that. That's right. Well, so I'm going to take a different tact. Uh, is, this, is this what advances it? Yes, on the, uh, the, the, one? the one he gets. Yeah, that one advances yes. it on the right. So I can assure you that if I fell on a lake and rip, ruptured my aorta or uh, I had some weird sarcoma, I, I would go to an academic medical center as well. And there's a lot of excellent things about the U.S. healthcare system. But if you have an opportunity to build a new medical school, I think one of the first things you should do is take a hard look at what we're doing in the United States. And perhaps we're not doing as well in some areas as others, and if you had a chance to design something different, maybe you ought to take a look at those things. So I had the rare opportunity of starting the first new medical school on the West Coast of the United States in almost 50 years, six years ago. So as we begin to look at some of the things about the U.S. healthcare system, some things become pretty obvious. One is that we are an extremely expensive healthcare system. So we are the costliest healthcare system in the world by a large margin. And this doesn't necessarily translate into being the best healthcare system by a variety of measurements. So let's take a look at some of those things. Uh, life expectancy, probably the, if you will, the most uh, you know, telling uh, uh, statistic. We're 30th in the world. Uh, by a wide variety of healthcare markers, we're somewhere, I think we're just ahead of Bulgaria. Uh, so, you know, we're not even in the top tier of healthcare as judged by most healthcare statistics. Uh, this is another way of looking at that same number. We spend about $6,000 a, a person in the United States for healthcare, and uh, the average uh, for industrialized countries is, is under half that figure. And we spend a great deal of money on uh, chronic illness, and we spend a lot uh, of money on lost productivity because the way that we pay for healthcare system uh, has is not organized around providing higher quality health. It is much more if you pay for widgets, why should we be shocked that we produce more widgets than anybody in the world? Now, another way of looking at our healthcare problem is one from an equity standpoint, since we talked about social justice. So let me give you some interesting statistics about the United States. The difference between the life expectancy of Asian American women, that's by the way uh, just outside of New York City, and uh, Native Americans uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Indian Reservation in South Dakota is 33 years. That's the difference in average life expectancy between those two groups in our country. Many of you have been to Washington, D.C. If you get on uh, the metro at downtown Washington, D.C., for every mile you uh, take on that uh, uh, subway heading toward uh, Northern Virginia, you lose one and a half years uh, of life expectancy. There is a 20-year life expectancy difference between the, the middle and the end of the red line. If you look at males in Bangladesh, they have a higher, longer life expectancy than African-American males in Harlem. And interestingly, we're also proud of our healthcare system. Interestingly, recent Latino immigrants actually have a better life expectancy when they come to our country, and it gets worse the longer they stay in the United States. So there are probably some problems in our country that probably need to be addressed by our future physicians. Now, you mentioned that I was a tropical disease specialist, so I love using tropical disease examples. I was a little country of Costa Rica with 125th, the per capita gross national product of the United States, outperformed the United States in every measurable health outcome. Life expectancy, infant mortality, maternal mortality, childhood immunization, care of diabetes, you name it, Costa Rica does better than we do. And why do they do that? Well, that country spends more money on prevention and wellness, something that we don't do very well in this country. They focus on cost-effective effective interventions. I would point out in the 1980s, we were spending one in every five dollars in the United States healthcare system, coronary bypass surgery, and no one had ever studied who benefits from it. When they finally did that study, they discovered that only one in five of the people that were receiving this $30,000 operation actually benefited from it. We were completing the infarcts, the most of them. So if we want to do better, for less money, maybe we should apply more of the scientific rigor to what we do, not in generating more things and generate more money. So those would be all the challenges that you have to face if you're designing a new medical school. In addition, that new medical school was in inland Southern California, and inland Southern California is not a particularly well-performing area in the state of California. 
By the way, it's a very large area, not as large as your catchment area, I'll give you that, but in Southern California, roughly the size of West Virginia. And it has four and a half million people in it. So it is both a pretty populous area, though spread out over a large geographic area, and it is a very rapidly growing. It's the fastest growing area in the states, the third fastest growing area in the United States. It is going to have about a 21% uh, uh, growth rate by 2030. Now, we don't perform well in many statistics. I just showed you a couple. Uh, in both San Bernie and Riverside County, we're close to the bottom in virtually every measure of health outcome. Well, you're building a medical school. Why do we build it in Riverside? Well, the region's justification is there was a physician shortage, which there is, by the way, and so let's build a medical school. Well, this tells you something about the depth of wisdom of the decision makers, because I can tell you that we could build one, two, we could build ten medical schools in Inland Southern California. It would have zero impact on the physician shortage, because I got news for you, doctors do not practice where they go to medical school. So <laughs> if you are trying to address that particular mission, perhaps you should take a look at what the drivers are around that. Now, one of the reasons this physician shortage is pretty severe, it's about 3,000 physician shortage, by the way, give you an idea what that means. The entire state of Indiana has about a 2,000 physician shortage, and Indiana isn't growing very fast. And in Southern California, about 40% of the doctors look like me. They're 55 years of age or older, and they're going to be retired in 10 years. And with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we are, uh, Inland Southern California has the largest increase in newly insured uh, in the state of California. We'll be adding a fairly significant percentage, about half a million people, to the insured roles. So, let's design a mission for our brand new medical school, and let's design the mission to actually, uh, in a way that it actually accomplishes the mission, rather than we, we like to tell the legislators that we're doing something. So, the first mission, and I have four missions, and I have a slide for each of them, was to expand and diversify the physician workforce in our region. So how do we do that? Well, let's first figure out why doctors practice where they practice. There are only two determinants of that. About 40% of the decision is where you come from, equally divided between where you're born, where you went to high school, where you went to college. And between 40 and 60% of that decision, depending on whether it's urban or rural, is based on where you finish your graduate medical education. So, if you build a med school, it won't have any impact at all. Obviously, the solution to the problem is, you better get out there and build pipeline programs in your own geographic area, because in Southern California has the lowest college going rate, the lowest standardized test scores, and the uh, highest dropout rate of any place in California. We better be out there building pipeline programs in our backyard, because we need to recruit students that come from Inland Southern California for that reason. In addition, if you ever wonder Sorry about this academic medical center discussion, but you realize that 95% of healthcare in the United States takes place in outpatient clinics, not in academic medical centers. Yet, almost 95% of medical education in the United States takes place in big academic medical centers. And we wonder why doctors don't want to go and practice in the areas that our country needs, which are largely outpatient and uh, community hospital based. Then finally, since residency is a major determinant you have to build brand new graduate medical education programs to accomplish this goal, and you better build them in the specialties that are in short supply in your geographic area. Now the second mission. Make sure I'm on the same slide here. Oh, that was that, was that slide. Oh, oh, it's got one of these rollouts. Oh, God, this is going to be tough not looking here. All right. So uh, we also want to produce doctors that actually go in the fields we need. Now, many of you may not know this, but uh, probably no more than one in four or one in five of the graduates of the medical schools in California are going into primary care. Now, if you go to any industrialized country in the world, you realize that about half the graduates of medical schools have to go into primary care for any kind of healthcare system to work, but none of the current medical schools are doing that, and I would argue they all say, well, it's what the students want to do. They don't look at the way that they've actually structured themselves they are actually getting the outcome that you could have predicted they would have given their teaching platform. So the first thing you would do is you would select different students. Oh, does that sound like heresy? Well, I went to Case Western Reserve University, and for 40 years, the only predictor of a career in primary care present on the application to med school was previous service in the Peace Corps. Now, if you extrapolate that, why don't we select students that have service-based learning activities as part of their pre-med preparation, that will enrich the likelihood of it going into population or people-based specialties, and we get much more primary care. So let's uh, adapt our admission process to enrich for that. 
Most of the faculty in academic medical centers are specialists, and we again wonder, as role models, why all the students want to go into those fields. So, have most of your faculty come from the specialties that you want them to go into. Emphasize not only primary care, but ambulatory-based teaching. Now, ambulatory-based teaching is more expensive, but that's where healthcare needs to take place. Most good doctors that graduate from medical school and residency training programs are very worried about practicing outpatient setting because they've never done it as part of their training. Identify other specialties that are in short supply. It's not just primary care. So in our region, in addition to primary care, we actually have a greater shortage of psychiatrists than family physicians. So psychiatry is often unappreciated as a very underrepresented specialty. We're largely a rural community, much as your catchment area, so general surgery is critical because every one of those small hospitals has to have a team of general surgeons. And finally, since we have the highest fertility rate in California, we need more OBGYNs. So we need to create specialties, and those are the six that we picked. Too tricky for me here. Okay, diversity. Now, diversity in our medical school is not only the right thing to do, it's also a smart thing to do. Now, in my introduction, I told, I was told I was a tropical disease specialist. So I will tell you that if all you want is your doctors to write prescriptions, we can and do teach them medical Spanish. But if you want your doctors to change the behavior of their patients, birth spacing, breastfeeding, eat differently, exercise more, having physicians that come from the social background of their patients is a huge advantage. So there is an additional advantage to recruit students that are reflective of the populations they're going to serve. And it's not just ethnic uh, changes. So for instance, one of the most disturbing statistics in the IOM report on graduate medical education is today, 80% of the doctors in training in the United States today come from the top two quintiles of economic status. Less than 5% come from the bottom quintile. And we wonder why we're having trouble getting to work in underserved areas. They wouldn't know an underserved area. They're afraid of going in underserved areas. If we want doctors to work in underserved areas, <clears throat> we better look at economic and educational disadvantage status as part of that selection process. Um, so we have our last mission, which I must say is the one I was most excited about. Although I'm appalled that we're one of the few medical schools in the United States that has this mission, we actually had a mission to actually improve the healthy community we serve. What a strange idea for a public institution to have. Well, how do we do that? Well. One of the things I would argue is every other country, industrialized country in the world has recognized the artificial separation between public health and medical training. These are very separate in the United States. We need to develop more integration between public health and medical training, in my opinion. We need to change the focus of our research. Yes, we do NIH-funded basic science research like everyone else, but we were also going to be strong in population-based health outcomes research, quality improvement research, cost-effectiveness research, the kind of research that's necessary to take the breakthroughs that others are making and make them actually cost effective and have an impact statistically on the health of populations. And yes, we don't have a university hospital. Now, one of the interesting aspects of your own university hospital is you realize this is a competitive model. When you're a university hospital with your own practice, you are in direct competition with the other doctors and hospitals in the area, and uh, that is not the best way to work together around the common goal of improving health in your community. So we didn't do that. We said, we're going to use all the hospitals, FQHCs, doctor's offices in our own area, and we're going to use the whole thing as a teaching platform. And we're going to unite around the common goal of training the future physicians and taking care of the people who live in our region. Somewhat radical idea. So what did we do at Riverside? Well, yes, we did build a medical school. But the more important thing is we build a complete pipeline. We actually have enrichment programs that reach all the way down to K through 12. We actually picked schools with particularly disadvantaged backgrounds and educational disadvantaged backgrounds and built health academies in those schools. We have programs in colleges and universities, including we're the only university I know in the country that actually took over all pre-health advising. What is this biology, chemistry, and physics major? I don't mean to insult everyone I know about getting into med school. You ought to have a med school people tell you how to get into med school, and that's what we do. So we run all pre-health advising. We have a med school, yes. We build graduate programs in those six fields. And we have an additional responsibility to train all the doctors that are practicing out there and continuing medical education because they're part of that healthcare team that are delivering them. Now, some of you may know, we had a little trouble getting this thing open. <laughs> in fact, when I was recruited in 2010, I was told we had the money. That didn't turn out to be the case. So I came in 2010 to open the med school. This idea had been percolating for some time. In 2004, the Regents did a study, discovered, oh my goodness, there hadn't been a new medical school in the United States since 1970. And none of the existing medical schools had expanded in size. 
And did somebody not think we're going to need more doctors? I mean, we're not only growing, but we're aging. Of course we're going to need more doctors. So actually, a <laughs> former dean actually from the medical college, Buzz Cooper, in 2000, finally said, what is wrong with us? We need more doctors. Not, we're not going to have too many. And Florida State was actually the first new school that was created in about the early 2000s. And so now there's about 20 new schools. But unfortunately, we went to build ours at a pretty bad time economically. So when I first got there, I was told that we had been in the region's budget for every year since 2008, but we kept getting bounced out by what you call the Gang of Five that made the decisions at the end. So I went to Governor Schwarzenegger, and I had to survive a cigar tent. Many of you may know he smokes big, fat cigars, and that's illegal in the Capitol, so he has a tent out in the courtyard of the Capitol. So uh, I convinced him I could get it back on the budget. He wouldn't cut it. So we went down. We had $10 million a year in annual support for the med school. At the end of the day, I got $10 million in one-time money. He said, get the school open, and then come back, and we'll give you ongoing money. That's what we did. We went and hired everybody, we organized, we went for accreditation. And unfortunately, Governor Brown then became the governor, and he decided on the 28th of June uh, to cut us out of the budget. And as a direct result, we were turned down by the LCME, that's the National Accrediting Body. Now let me tell you, there's never been a med school in the history of the United States ever turned down by the LCME that's ever opened. So that's where we were in 2011. Well, we didn't have enough money to make it for more than a year or two. We would have burned out all the money that had been raised before I got there. So the only way to get it open is we turned to our community, and we raised $100 million in nine months. We made it by three days. We turned in the application. We got a second site visit. We got approved based on that money, and we opened that medical school uh, in 2012, and we took our first class, and then... Stranger things happened. We went back to the legislature, and they gave us $15 million in annual state support. And so today, uh, we have a medical school. It is accredited. In fact, we just received the second step in accreditation. That's a provisional accreditation uh, about uh, two months ago. Uh, we are funded. We actually are in the black, and uh, we have a wonderful group of students, and we teach entirely off a of community medical center. So let's go back to some of those ideas. Doctors practice where they grow up, and they practice where they uh, basically finish their residency. So we have a whole lot of pipeline programs that we are actively running to bring more students that we're looking for so we can pick them to get into our med school. In addition, we have a very unusual way of picking our students. So we think of standardized test scores and grade points as a threshold phenomenon. And I will tell you, there is zero evidence that having an ever higher grade point or ever higher standardized test score has, has anything to do with your graduate from med school or being a good doctor. In fact, when you think about it, at the very top of those, interestingly, the MedCat score, if you get above 36, the odds of you graduate from med school goes down. And I would offer more concerning to me is the asshole quotient when you get up that very high status score goes way up. And so is this the best way to be picking our doctors? So we don't do that. We look at other qualities from a uh, qualified pool, and we pick our students. And we had a difficult time with diversity. Actually, every UC has problem with diversity because they roll out the UC standard diversity statement. The problem with that is you can't measure it. And the second problem is it's illegal because of Prop 209. So this was getting us into trouble. We blew the whole thing out of the water. We defined diversity ourselves, which we're allowed to do. Our diversity is listed here. First in the family to attend college. English as a second language, educational and or economic disadvantage status, and grew up in a medically uncertain area with a particular emphasis in our own area. So if you came from Blythe, we gave you an advantage over uh, Palm Springs. Came from Palm Springs, we gave you an advantage over Riverside. Those are all in Riverside County, by the way. If you came from Riverside, we gave you an advantage over L.A. Came from L.A., we gave you an advantage over anybody from Northern California. And we are the only med school in California that never looks at out-of-staters. Interesting for a public institution. So uh, that's how we pick our students. To show you what we did, and not just what we say, these are our classes that we picked. And let me just point out the 2019 class, 48% of our students come from that bottom quintile of economic status, 42% are underrepresented in medicine. If you eliminate the traditional black medical schools in the United States, it's the highest um, percentage of underrepresented medicine students in the country. And 66% of them come from inland Southern California, despite the fact that only 5% of our pool came from inland Southern California. We had 6,000 applications for our 50 spots. We've done a couple of interesting things in addition to being like many medical schools. 
We actually added, we took UCLA's curriculum, we added two competencies. I like to kid UCLA that we added um, academic productivity to our, to our status. Uh, we also added community health because we are more of a public health basis. All of our students spend three years in an outpatient setting, usually a federally qualified health care center, from the very beginning so that they learn about practicing medicine in an outpatient setting. We have integrated clerkships. We actually integrate medicine and surgery. We integrate OB, PEDS, and family medicine. So we teach in a somewhat different way. And then we come back in the fourth year and we give them that basic science after they've been taught clinical medicine, which I think I always wished I'd had. One of the key things that we did is we had a novel way of, identifying, uh, of addressing indebtedness, try to use it to our advantage. We offer mission-based scholarships. Basically, if you promise to practice for five years in Inland Southern California in one of the six specialties in short supply, medical school is free, and I've gone out and raised the money. We offered this last year 14 mission-based scholarships to our school. So basically, we're eliminating that as a reason to go into other specialties. And yes, in addition to building that medical school, we are the only new medical school in the United States that has actually built an even larger graduate medical education program from scratch. At a time where people are talking about cutting GME, we have two family medicine programs. We'll have a third open in 17. We have a general surgery program. We'll have another one in 18. I have already a 72% outpatient or ambulatory based internal medicine residency. I'll have two more by 2016. I partnered with Loma Linda's Children's Hospital. You have to have a children's hospital have a pediatric residency. We run an ambulatory-based pediatric track in Loma Linda's program. We have a psychiatry program. We'll have a second one in 16. And we'll have an OB program in 17 and a neurology program in 18. By the time my school gets to 320 medical school students, I'll have 400 new GME physicians. Now, most of you know I'm not at UCR anymore. So in case many of you thought I'd sold out, I went to uh, St. George's University, which I am at. Let me just point out a couple things about St. George's in my last slide. It was established in 1976. It's the oldest of the Caribbean schools. It is located in Grenada. It's now a comprehensive university, by the way. It has a veterinary school, a graduate school, an undergraduate school, obviously a medical school. It gives master's degrees in both business and public health. It has 7,000 students. Basically, in the medical school, two years are in Grenada and two years are spent in the 70 hospitals we affiliate with in the United States and England. Uh, what you may not know is that 1% uh, of the current practicing physicians in the United States are graduates of St. George's University. So we are a major source of physician manpower for this country. Now, what you may not have also know is 71% of our graduates go into primary care in contrast to 39% of U.S. medical schools. Uh, we actually practice almost twice as much in underserved areas as the graduates of U.S. medical schools. And our graduates uh, see 18% of their patients with Medicaid, whereas the average U.S. graduate sees 10%. So one of the reasons I went there is because this is a school that I think is interested in the social mandate of medicine as much as Riverside was. So I'm going to stop there. And I guess now Julie and I can answer questions. Davis is my favorite of the UC, so I, that's so why I'm part of it. Part of it, and I think you really have to mirror uh, who, who's in your community, and it's so important that the people that you serve, you look like. And, and what's interesting about our community, too, is we're so big that depending on where you travel, it's different. And so trying to address the needs of those on uh, this side of the causeway, as well as Northern California, Sacramento, and the county system, it's been very fascinating. So this being a courtroom, um, <laughs> the one place where you two, you, had, you both believe in all the same things, you came very similar. The one place where you came down on opposite sides of the question, and part of it is, of course, just history, but is having or not having a university teaching hospital. Um, so can you, can you either say that one works better you know, in the different contexts, or can you debate the, the pros and cons? If you could start all over and do it all over again, each of you, would you which would you have? Well, I think it depends on who you serve. So I think um, the way we serve Northern California, we need an academic health care center to serve the needs of the 
other community hospitals. And if you saw what we're doing now is we're trying to partner as fast as we can with community hospitals. There's two reasons. One, it helps us for training, because I actually agree with Dick. Um, we have a good primary care network. We need to be outpatient. We need to be at smaller hospitals. And if we don't partner with them, they're going to go under in Northern California. Because unless we figure out ways to keep them alive up in Yuba City and Chico and all that, there will be no hospitals up there, and they all will have to come down to Sacramento. So I think our, our uh, mission uh, in Northern California is that we need to be an academic health care center for referrals, but we need to partner with more of the regional hospitals. We were even doing that at Hopkins before we left. We partnered with five or six regional hospitals to feed us the cases appropriate, but to keep them alive in the community. In your case, if there had been an academic health care center, say there was a county hospital for a buck, would you have bought it? I mean, <laughs> I mean what, mainly I think there wasn't. Well, first of all, I would say, looking to the future, I wouldn't buy any hospitals because we actually hospitalize way more patients than we need to. And we hospitalize them for two reasons. We often hospitalize them unnecessarily. And the other thing is that we don't do a good job of keeping them well. And as a result, they get hospitalized. So if you really look at uh, more industrialized countries, we do way too much hospitalization. So I wouldn't be in the hospital business right now, personally. I would be in the outpatient business building more comprehensive, complex outpatient facilities. That's where the future, I think, I think they just build a hospital in Missouri that has no beds. Right. So Actually, we build a day hospital, the medical college, right. uh, which is a cancer hospital where people sleep in their own beds at night, and they come in for very comprehensive care during the day. The question about academic medical centers, clearly there's a role of academic medical centers. I just believe that there are too many academic medical centers in relation to, to the total training of physicians. We need to be more in balance. I mean, if virtually every doctor in the United States is training a big academic medical center, we're going to get the outcome we want. And you don't have a problem here. Clearly, Davis needs to be the academic medical center in Northern California. I think that is self-evident. But look at Southern California. Do we really need all those academic medical centers? Do we really need a liver and heart transplant program in eight different places? Do we really need uh, you know, proton beam machines across the street from each other from competing healthcare systems? See, I don't think that's a good idea. So I would argue that when I looked at Southern California and our needs, our region really didn't need to be able to build a big academic medical center. Listen, we can train, uh, uh, send all that you know, stuff, appropriate stuff, down to Irvine or UCLA or San Diego. We let them do it. They're going to fight. By the way, they're going to have to fight it out over who survives because there's not enough business, in my opinion, for three of them to survive. And let us do the other end of the business. And they do what they do well and let us do what we need to do well. But we need to train doctors in the future in a more balanced teaching platform. And my argument is the U.S. is not balanced today. And I think the one thing we're doing at uh, Davis is our, our students spend time in the student-run clinics, primary care networks, Kaiser, Sutter. Um, they really are in the outpatient arena. And we do know that most of them are going to practice that way. And we have role models that are doing it. Because I think that's the other piece is you need to find someone that does that, that looks happy and good. You know, and so making sure you celebrate your primary care doctor is making them part of the team. Last year, half our class went into primary care. We're really proud of that. But that's because we had great family practice, great internal medicine, great pediatrics that are out there doing those things and making that a really exciting part of their practice. But at the same time, uh, because there's no one else to do that, having us feed the kidney. We, we do more kidney transplants at UC Davis than anyone in the country except San Francisco and Miami. And nobody knows that. But we do over 300 because we are throughout the whole northern part of the state taking anyone that needs a kidney transplant. That's important. However, we gave up our liver program because we only had about 50 people in our region that needed liver transplants. And we actually sent them to San Francisco to do that. So part of it is looking at what you're delivering and are you good at it because you have to do it. And then also to, to look at how patients travel. The other thing we're enhancing too is uh, pediatric surgery. Most of the t uh, kids that needed surgery 20 years ago went to San Francisco or Stanford, and that's really hard on families. So having the Shriners as well as pediatric surgery here would make it so our patients don't have to travel. So I think looking at that is really important. And you have Loma Linda out there that actually you can use as a great referral base for your patients. So both of you spoke in a way that sounded exciting, addressing community needs, or the future of medicine, the way we're not kind of there now. What are your conversations like with folks in your positions at schools that aren't doing the things that UC Davis or Riverside are doing? 
Do they look at you and think you're crazy? Like, what, how does how does that go? They love Julie. <laughs> Let me tell you a sad thing. In the 1970s, there were about 25 new medical schools that were established. Over half of them had exactly the same mission that UC Riverside has today. Not a one of them had that mission today. So, uh, having said what I said, uh, until the economics in this country change, and they're changing, but they're not changing very fast, trying to maintain a public mission, even in a public institution, is a real up hill slug, and I can tell you that uh, we are looked down on by the deans at other schools. We actually had negative things said about us by deans at some, what will remain nameless East Coast high intensity research institutions, <laughs> uh, who basically made the, uh, what I think is complete hubris, that you can only get a good medical education in a place that has a lot of high and NIH funded research. That's complete bullshit. The interaction between most of the people that do NIH funded research in medical student education today is virtually non-existent. In fact, pure MDs that do medical research, like me in my early career, they don't exist anymore. The average R01 funding for an MD only is 52 years, first time funding. So it just doesn't exist. So I would argue that we are providing an important and needed part, and that I think what we're doing ought to be more appreciated, not, you know, what we're doing is not what they're doing. I don't trash what they're doing. I think what, that what they're doing is a fine thing, but uh, you know, the community-based medical schools in the United States are clearly looked down on uh, by others, and you know, obviously the Caribbean schools are really looked down on. So no, it's a, it's a major PR battle for us to argue that somebody has to train doctors that actually are going to places that our country needs. I, there was just an editorial written by, not Hopkins, just to make sure, <laughs> no, 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 no. Other East Coast, saying you cannot have a medical school without a, a heavy-duty research base. And so it really gave us a lot to think about because, you know, maybe there are students that really want to be a primary care doctor. We have a program with Kaiser now, which you probably know, three years of med school with us. They stay with us and then go into Kaiser for three years and become a primary care doctor with that one last year. They're helping fund their tuition. Um, and these kids, are they know that's what they want to do. Now, it's interesting. I know one of them is going to change his mind because he wants to be a surgeon. I can just tell him by his eyes because so they don't always know. But I think coming up with appreciation of what each person brings to the table, I think, is the unique characteristics of Davis. Some of my primary care doctors think that I'm crazy, that you can't do kidney transplants, you can't do fetal, uh, we're operating on fetuses, we can't do fetal surgery, I'm a vascular, you can't do that and do this other. And I actually think we can't not do it. That we actually uh, are blessed that we have a good primary care network in parts of Northern California. We can develop it. And I agree with him. We don't want to buy any more hospitals. Because uh, I do think eventually people are not going to be in hospitals. But you and I also think if you're sick, you really want to be in a hospital, right? Because you don't want to go home. And so part of it is training all of us to know that you're probably better served at home. And having tools and ways to monitor and take care of you. We're doing a lot of that. So. You're on an iPad, and you're on TV, and I see you every day, but you're not in my hospital, so that will come. So I actually think you have to do both, and, and a few of the other UCs do not have primary care networks, uh, and so we're lucky to have that. But you have to appreciate both. So as we partner with Yuba City and we partner with uh, Chico, um, you have to say, you know, you have to appreciate those doctors who are practicing there. One, you don't want to practice there, right? You want to practice here. Two, they're doing this amazing stuff to prevent illness. And three, uh, they're going to talk to us about what we do and we're partners. They are changing the way we get paid, which is interesting. It used to be fee for service. So the more I would do, the more I'd get paid. And some people would do a little bit more because they get paid a little bit more. Um, now they're going to pay us for value base, which means they're actually going to look at indications and look at outcomes. And the new generation actually uh, can relate to that. They, they actually have a a way of, of looking at the whole spectrum of disease in the students that we choose very similar to him with many um, interviews coming from underserved areas really have stories they can tell where their families didn't have access to dentists and they didn't have access to primary care. So I think we're in a real good place. Now that being said, when I first went to my first dean's meeting, because you know, here's my new people, okay, so I walk in, thank God you were there. So, so there's a third that actually are doing this, that are on university based or community-based or looking at that, and they're really managing their hospitals and trying to affect care, and we're doing a new strategic planning process to look at what we do. Then there is a third um, that are just education. They're not having anything to do with hospitals. They're really just looking at NIH, and, 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 and someone else is managing their hospitals, and they're just hoping it works out okay. 
And then there's a third that are so old they need to quit. I mean, there's a bunch of them that have been deans, uh, don't quote me, for 30 or 40 years, and they're really wishing that you know the NIH dream and all of this in rankings would stay the same because they loved it. You know, they loved it. And so as you talk to them, they really don't get why we need all these other people coming to take care of patients in areas that they would never live. And so I think we're going to see a change because I think we're seeing more um, physicians and people who have practiced becoming deans. And I think that's a good thing because we have to get involved. So there's like eight surgeons that are deans now, which nobody would know, and primary care doctors becoming deans. And I also think uh, that we're realizing that that's the key to health is prevention versus treatment, even though treatment's fun. You know, I'm a surgeon, but, um, but to prevent, because no matter what we do, if we don't get more healthy people, we're doomed. We need lots of healthy people so that we don't have to spend lots of money on fixing them. So it's that simple. So the way to do that, and that's why I came here, is you can actually make healthier people. And the one thing about Northern California we're actually pretty healthy. We have some zip codes, too, that you will die 10 years earlier. There's no question, that, and we can pick them out. But zip codes right around the city, we actually do pretty well. And we're targeting those zip codes where you die early, and it's mainly because of prevention. So, Julie, you sort of got to this uh, in a few minutes ago, but I want to pr push the question. So Ken asked you about the two, contrasting the two models of, of uh, university medical schools, but I want to push a little farther uh, on why are universities even in the health care provision game at all? We have, I mean, the University of California Davis is an agricultural and, well, it's founded as a land-grant university, and so the mechanic arts part, engineering, you know, we do engineering, we train people to build cars, build computers, program computers, build integrated circuits and all that, but we don't actually sell any of those things or provide that to any of the company other than on a research basis. We have the number one agricultural school in the world. We don't have production in agriculture. We don't sell agricultural products. Uh, heck, we have the top viticulture and enology program in the world, and we don't even sell our own wine. Um, unfortunately, we can get to drink some occasionally, and maybe later. Uh, so why have we gone so far uh, in medicine and probably vet med that we're actually community providers, we're providing a service that's, that's something very different from the way the rest of the university works? And that's a great question, because if you look at what most people do now, you outsource what you don't do. So like in the hospital, we don't cook food and we don't do laundry. So we actually now outsource it. But it used to be hospitals made all the own food for their patients and did all the laundry. There is a piece out there that's looking at the five UC hospitals, um, because should someone else run them? Should we become this consortium? Should we get into the business? of um, being tertiary care and quaternary care hospitals that actually contract and do things as a hospital unit. And there is something sitting before the regions in November to actually create a regental committee that actually is focused on this healthcare uh, entity and do it better. Because we aren't very nimble either. If I want to partner with a hospital, I have to wait for a regents meeting. I mean, and those don't happen every month. And by that time, you know, Sutter could get that hospital or somebody else. And so I guess I would tell you that the students I teach need a hospital as a laboratory or a classroom. And that's probably why it started, is that when you trained doctors and nurses, you felt you needed a hospital. But as Dick just said, maybe in the future we really need clinics, but it was really their, their place to teach and train. And that's probably why we got in the business. We also think it's a social good to have a hospital, that that's part of what we do, that wouldn't it be great that we have a great uh, pediatric hospital in Sacramento so you don't have to take your child or grandchild far away. So I think it was part of the social good. But now that it turns out that it's really, it's very complicated to run a hospital and to be a doctor you don't necessarily can do the research anymore, the model's changing. That being said though, we need to come up with a different model because right now university hospitals actually fuel the medical school. And so it's gone the other way. So we have to figure out some way to get 20 plus in some medical schools at Hopkins. The number that we gave the university was even higher with an extra zero on it. Uh, that that's fueling the universities. So there's actually this, this yin. And what would the public say if they knew that's what we were doing with their money? And, and actually that's part of the accountable care. I've seen university hospitals too expensive. I know you do all this stuff. But, you know, I'm not going to benefit from all of this. So I guess the piece of me is I think we need both of us. We need that to take care of communities. 
But I also worry if we don't continue the university hospital, that discovery and innovation will go away, and we will um, uh, we will regret that later. That being said, though, I actually am for having a group of people, especially California, since we're a, a team, that we actually put these hospitals together, drive efficiencies, lower cost, figure out who should be doing liver transplants. Most young people will travel anywhere. I mean, they go to they will go to Seattle for a wedding this weekend, right? So if they had to get a liver transplant, we said you had to go to San Diego. They go, okay. Where my dad says, why isn't it across the street? And I, of course, want it where I live. But young people will travel. Uh, but I do think that um, the model of discovery and innovation would be destroyed if we did not have university hospital. I know you didn't ask the question, but let me just answer your question. It's all about the money. I don't care whatever other people say. The re and, and Davis may be a special case. Granted, this was a public uh, hospital they took over and ran. But in general, the reason that uh, medical schools have hospitals is to make money. And that's because the current financial reimbursement of the United States is very organized around high profitability of high-end activities and expensive high-end activities, and that's why people want to own their own hospitals. As soon as hospitals start losing money, you're going to see a lot of universities that will try to divest themselves of their hospitals, and that's coming. I just don't know when. Well, UCSF and UCLA's margins are double-digit because the county patients go to the county hospitals. However, UCSF just built a new hospital. And, and, and it is eating their lunch because it's so expensive. That happened to me in Hopkins, too, where all of a sudden you have a million dollars worth of expenses of air conditioning and, and people that need to work because it's big and it's beautiful and it's lovely. And now their margin sitting this year is about 0.5% because they're having to pay for a set. They have two hospitals now. And also, by the way, they bought Oakland or got Oakland Children's. Uh, UCLA, I think, is 23% margin. You know, and that's because everyone, oh, it's, it's, you cannot go to UCLA without insurance. That you can't go there if you're a county patient. So you also don't want to do that to the county patient because if they get admitted, I work there. If they get admitted, then they will have to pay the bill. So um, that's an interesting thing. But it's the safety net hospitals, I think, that are the university hospitals that are a struggle. And Ralph worries very every night that I'm going to say, Ralph, well, by the way, I'm, I'm broke. You know, that I'm not going to make a profit. So I think looking at the model and trying to figure out what exactly we do and understanding the different missions. And of course, I think, you know, they all ought to understand it. If you're a teaching hospital, his included, wouldn't it be great that they would give extra money to teach the doctors of tomorrow teaching hospitals so that they would cover your costs? Right now, we're just the same as Cedar sinai which has a little teaching. Um, of any private hospital, they pay the same at Kaiser, and Kaiser's none that overhead we do. But you did notice, I mean, they always are funding everything because their, their profits at Kaiser are huge. One, they have healthy patients, you have to have a job, and they come back for a screening, they do a great job with that, and they also tend to send all their sick patients out. We do all their kidney transplants, we do all their trauma for them. Uh, there's a reason for that. Money. Money. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, oh, sorry. Um, so I'm a sparring medical student, and I'm a little bit new to the ambulatory-based setting. So it seems like, based on the country's um, d uh, sorry, what saying, distribution, so it seems like they have a lot of different models and missions. So is ambulatory-based setting, is that a model being um, chose, taken by different medical schools, or do they have a different vision towards if it's beneficial, despite it being um, financially non feasible? Uh, most medical schools in the United States try to do most medical student education and inpatient services. And the reason for that is it's much cheaper for them to do it. Now, uh, the reason for that is, is that medical students tend to take time with patients. And so in an outpatient setting, it both slows down the throughput and it also uh, uh, increases room utilization. So most people, most uh, people in medical schools loathe having to do more outpatient-based teaching because it's more expensive for them to do it. It's a lot easier to just attach your medical students to an already existing resident team and let them fall around the doctors. It doesn't cost anything, et cetera. So it's going to be very difficult to get medical schools to move in that direction, again, because it's the money. And so I would argue, though, that ambulatory-based teaching needs to be a much bigger part of any doctor's training in the United States. The hard part is going to be finding a medical school that does it. Now, to Julie's credit, I think Davis has, is moving in that direction, despite the fact it's not more lucrative to do that. And the way to do that is to have a very large outpatient teaching platform so that you don't have too many learners in any one. 
so that you, you can tolerate a 10% slowdown, et cetera. But that requires big networks to do that. That's why Kaiser can do it. Kaiser has a huge network so that there will be a relatively small number of learners versus the amount of patients. It's really the only way to do that cost effectively. If you put uh, 20 uh, medical students in a, a federally qualified healthcare center, they would close it because they would take up too much time. But that's where medical training needs to be. And when I would look at medical schools and residencies, I would look to see how much ambulatory-based teaching they provide. Because I think that will be a, uh, a premium in quality pro programs. And, and we did have a rule when I got here that no students could go to our primary care clinics because they wanted to make them go fast. And partly the patients would get upset too, because if you have a student, they'll talk to you and examine you first. Then they walk out and then I come in. Um, you also, not every doctor was meant to teach. Uh, and we've come to that realization slowly but surely. Because I, when I have students with me in my clinic, I go faster. Because I actually send them to the patients that look easier, the post-op patients they'll learn from. I don't send them with the person with the medical record this thick and this crabby. You know, I go do that one, you know, because that's not going to work out. Uh, at the Davis Clinic, we're going to start having students there. And, and that's new, you know. And then one reason, too, is our young faculty at your Davis Clinic would like students because they want that feeling, they love taking care of you, but they also love that feeling of teaching. And in order to keep my primary care doctors in some of my clinics, if I don't let them do some teaching, they're going to leave me. Now the other thing about being a, a medical student in the clinic too, is to learn that it, it's not all about you. And, and that's the first thing to talk to a student about. You know, you, in order to get to medical school, it was all about you. Good grades make this happen. Once you get there, now it's all about the patient. So as you walk in there, you can't spend an hour going over every detail. I say, you got 15 minutes max, and then you got to come out, you know, and then we'll go in together and finish it off. Because you also can't make people suffer, you know, for the teaching. Um, but I do think that you'll see many more ambulatory, many rotations at Hopkins or Pure Ambulatory, um, that we actually put students on ambulatory, not standing in operating rooms for hours holding hooks. Uh, and here we actually have very vibrant uh, primary care and other clinics. We have student-run clinics that suffer the same thing. There's a bunch of undergrads that show up, a bunch of med students, and patients stay there all day on Saturday, where they really should be there 40 minutes. So we're, we're looking at that experience, too. It's great for the students, but the poor patients who actually are, are underserved are spending all day Saturday there, and, and we love them, but they actually should have the same efficiency, quality, and outcomes as my regular clinics. So, we're looking at that, too, and then some people just weren't meant to teach. I mean, they, they're crabby, they're not nice to the students, they, they actually tell them how much of a pain it is to have them with them, you know, so those people were axing out now, and they, they go do their research, you know, or they go do that heart surgery, they love to do 12 in a day and don't talk to anybody else. That Go do it, because you want that person to do your heart, but you don't want them to talk to you, okay? So you want them to do your heart, uh, and then talk to the nurse practitioner. And then there are some people that are just so skilled at teaching. You and I both are. We're very good teachers. Uh, tomorrow my OR, I'm going to have three undergrads. I'm going to have a visiting uh, vascular surgeon. I'll be teaching a fellow and a young faculty. There'll be ten of us there. That operation will go the same amount of time as if, in fact, it's probably going to go faster than if I was there alone. But I know how to do that. And not everyone is skilled at orchestrating a symphony. They really want to play a solo. I think I read the mic. <laughs> um, you know, I think that this has been and is being really exciting. I think this may take the uh, the, the cake for the most liberated um, comments. Um, you know, I think um, Dick, if I might, you you also really have shown how the status or rankings trap is leading a lot of institutions away from what would have been a much better. Uh, trajectory, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about the a possibility about research. And my thinking is also a little bit about some new uh, focus we're trying to bring in across research here on engaged scholarship. So, is there a possibility that, and we know that the, the money from those federal grants is ever harder to get, and maybe those are the gold standard grants in the minds of some, and that supports a certain kind of research, but I'm also thinking that as the dollars flow to a different kind of outcome in terms of care of populations, might there not be money available for research, and I don't know, I guess we'd have to work on the status of that research, which is much more connected to public health and just the population health that we want to achieve. 
Well, let me address that. And since I'm no longer at Riverside, I'll give you some secrets that I was uh, holding back. So, uh, actually, NIH and the big funding mechanisms is moving more toward more of the kind of research I talked about. And the reason for that is, is they're spending a ton of money. And there's no doubt that great breakthroughs take place. But we're not very good in this country at taking that and actually having a positive in impact on the improvement of health. I'll also point out that wet lab-based NIH-funded research, which is typically done in med schools, has, as Julia already showed, has about a 25% financial loss on dollars per dollar. So you can't afford to do that. Now, interestingly, if you did public health-related research, quality improvement research, uh, uh, population-based health outcomes research, there's actually a positive margin because you get to charge exactly the same indirect cost as you do in a wet lab, and the cost of that is much lower. The other opportunity is we've worked very hard in medical sc uh, schools with a lot of uh, close collaboration with the biochemists and the, and the physiologists, and et cetera, and that's great. But I think the real opportunity is to form the same partnerships, which you can only do at a comprehensive university, with the anthropologists, the sociologists, the psychologists. Now, I didn't mention this, but we started MD-PhD programs at Riverside, and uh, uh, in addition to the one you guessed I would have, which is in biomedical sciences, we have an MD-PhD program in engineering, one with anthropology, and with psychology. Now, why in the world are we like one of the few medical schools that have an MD-PhD in psychology? You would think that that would be a national, but historically, those are as divided as public health and medical schools. So, you know, my, I actually think that there's a great opportunity for Davis to get your social scientists more involved in the medical school in research. And not only will that uh, gain you more research dollars, because I believe that's a direction that uh, federal funding is going, but the overhead, the cost of that is less than what you'll get from the grants. You'll actually make money in the grants. The margin on those kind of grants is about 20 to 30 percent compared to about 25 percent loss uh, if you're doing wet lab based research. So I'd be going out there and, and trying to form partnerships with your social science uh, scientists, even fields you might not have, have guessed. You know, it, the drama department would be great at teaching doctors about OSCEs and around uh, interviewing patients. You, you laugh, there's a paper on that, on that exact uh, point. You know, you could uh, basically, wouldn't it be great to talk to people about uh, communication skills and writing better and other things that the comprehension university does well but has not been applied to the medical school. I think that's something a comprehensive university can do that others can't. And the sooner you see that and get into that field, the better you'll be in 10 years. And I think one of the issues with that is, you know, those third of deans that I told you that were very senior and old, they look at that and scoff. And so as we replace them, because they actually truly believe that unless it's NIH wet lab work, it's not valuable. But we did a study looking at all the research that was done at Hopkins before I left and what impact did they have to change the world. And there were lots of papers, there's lots of money, but changing practice was nothing. I mean, it was almost like we had impact zero, but we were able, you know what you love, was it has been continuously funded for 32 years, doing the same thing that makes no difference to anybody, but they keep getting funded. And so part of it is really changing that so that people understand that these kind of research projects that actually change practice, and that's what I tell my young people, what are you, now that you're established and you've done enough publications to get your first promotion, what are you going to do now that's going to change practice or the world? And that's what you ought to aim for. My best paper I ever wrote was two years ago, and, and where we actually looked at the best way to treat aneurysms, endovascular versus open. It was a big clinical trial in the VA, which also people used to scoff at VA research, but it actually changed practice and how we address patients. So really looking at that question more and getting people to realize it's not really the ranking, even though we, I can tell you where we're ranked. You know, we're number 31 in NIH funding, and, and it matters to everyone, you know, to do it. But if we could move some of us, and you're actually right, we have not done enough. And actually, uh, Ralph has put me in charge of the, the search for the new dean of LMS. Now I know why is that he wants me to learn more about the university where because I'm brave enough, I think, like you are, to partner and do it. And let me just say something about ranking. I'll be proud to come back if you. Uh, there was a very controversial study six years ago published in JAMA. That's one of our big papers, uh, ranking medical schools by their impact on social mission because that's I think the topic of this. And uh, I was appalled at how the University of California came out. Now that's not to say. That you could compare NIH ranking with social, and there are some places like University of Washington, Seattle, very high in both of those parameters. 
So you can be both socially conscious and you can be a high-powered uh, scientific uh, juggernaut. But, you know, I think I would look at myself twice if I was really high in U.S. News and World Report and I'm really low on, uh, on social mission. Okay. Um, I think that program at UC Riverside for um, encouraging students to stay in the area and practice um, to get some of their uh, medical school paid for sounds like a great program. And my question uh, questions are, how many other schools in the nation are doing that kind of thing? And do students at UC Riverside in those schools who are not in the disadvantaged category also get that opportunity? Uh, uh, two different questions. Uh, the scholarships uh, uh, are not related to their economic status. Uh, so those mission-based scholarships are based on merit, but we, uh, but there is a commitment that they make. By the way, if they want to be a plastic surgeon in Los Angeles, we let them do that. They just pay back their entire medical school tuition as a loan. They're really no off, uh, worse off than if they borrow the money. We're the only med school in the country that offers mission-based scholarships, but I will be honest with you, I ruthlessly stole that idea from the military. That's exactly what the military medical system does. I think others will copy it. I actually wish the whole University of California system would start such a program because it would show a little more social responsibility to addressing the physician manpower shortages but in That's why Kaiser's paying for our students in our program here. They're banking on them saying to work with Kaiser. But they don't make a connection. See, that, that's the difference between a scholar. You try, to, you try to guess what people are going to do, and then we're somehow shocked that they don't do it. Right. And listen, I have kids, so I, I understand how that works. I think you have to have a very clear social contract. If you get medical school free, this is what you've got to do to pay it back. And by the way, most of the loan repayment programs that happen at the end are too late. They're already differentiated away from what we need. You've got to do it on the front end as they enter med school. And I think, we'll, I think this will be a highly successful program. And the other thing is to figure out how to endow medical schools. So Michigan is trying to endow each of their spots in medical school. Because what would you do if there was no cost? You know, when do you get the best students, right? And so this ACEPC program, we are getting the best students because they only have to go three years and to do it. I want to do it for psychiatry and for general surgery, too. And could we endow that? We have one matching funds that endow now for one spot. But our goal is to try to endow all of it so that indebtedness does not determine what the students end up choosing to do. Especially now, many of them are partnered with each other now that there's an increased number of women in medical school. We have 63% this year. Many of them partner with each other, so now they've got double the debt. And so you've got two people trying to figure out how to get through this and make it happen. And where, uh, where going when they go into the primary care, we don't value it enough, and the reimbursement's lower even for general surgeons in rural areas. The reimbursement's much lower than if you're in a city. So coming up with ways to reward them, which may be just making them less indebted so they go do what they want, versus trying to figure out how to pay them more when they're done may be the best way to do it. I just want to add that uh, the, in addition to the military, uh, the PhD programs, many by uh, the med, uh, scientific PhD programs, you do the same thing. For, you stay in the field for so many years, you are funded and your debt is paid. I want to thank our speakers and um, also all of you for engaging in a very lively conversation. We're not such a large group that when we repair to the reception, we can't continue this discussion. But let's give our speakers a wonderful round of applause. Thank you.